I'm traveling the world knowing that I've done the hard work to produce this content. It's a decade later and I'm still bringing the same income I was 10 years ago from this same business, largely based on the same content. Hey, this is Yaro. Before I press play on today's episode of the EJ podcast, I'd like to invite you to download the latest version of my Blog Profits Blueprint, a free report available in audio and written text that will take you through an A to Z guide on how to set up a blog designed to be your main online marketing channel. I'll teach you how to grow your email list. I'll teach you how to grow your brand. And most importantly, how to make sales of your products and services using the power of blogging. It's been downloaded over 150,000 times already and is the starting point for many of the most popular bloggers you know today. You can get it for free from blogprofitsblueprint.com. Hello, this is Yaro Stark and welcome to a solo EJ podcast episode where today I'm going to be talking about the all important subject of content. Now, this is a subject that I have written about and taught for so many years now. It's become really second nature for me, but it's also, because of the amount of time, given me the opportunity to really see the changing landscape in terms of what works in getting traffic and getting customers and growing a platform and building a brand and becoming an expert and becoming well-known and all those things using content to do so. And also factoring in the various types of multimedia and platforms that we now have access to, which have slowly surfaced over the last sort of 10 to 15 years that I've been producing content, everything from video with YouTube and social media with Facebook and then, you know, slides with SlideShare, article sharing on LinkedIn, uh, you know, instant stories and images on Instagram and Snapchat. Uh, We got pinning pictures on Pinterest. There's a lot of P's there. So, you know, there's all kinds of ways to distribute content. There's all kinds of formats we can produce content in. I think it's about time I weigh in on what I think you should do today for the current environment we face, the very crowded internet, the content full internet, and how you can stand out from a crowd. Uh, Most importantly, though, how you can find that niche audience, that, that little tribe of people who follow what you do, you don't have to be the you know world famous person, but you have to find enough people to get that six figure or more business that I know you want. And to do that, content, in my opinion, is by far the best way to go about growing an audience, and in particular, a stable, long term, and potentially very hands off, long term though audience. It's obviously going to take a lot of work to initially build up the content, and we all go through this phase of producing work, putting a lot of effort in, with the plan in the future being able to essentially live off the efforts of your past self. So getting all the traffic, finding new customers, growing your email list, thanks to articles and videos and whatever else you produced over the years, podcasts that continue to deliver ongoing audience and growth, otherwise known as evergreen content, or as I have called it over the years, pillar content. So I'd like to start this discussion with a quick look back over the sort of history of content production, and in particular, this concept of pillar content or the pillar article, which I first wrote about uh, 10 years ago now. It's that long, and it really took off. Uh, It became a phrase that people used to to talk about good content and really became, I guess, a, a, a definition for what good content is. However, it often gets a bit uh, confused because people think a pillar content, a piece of content is a pillar because of what's in it, where in fact, what I really highlighted when I wrote the post was it's not about what's in the content as much as it is about what the content does. That still obviously relies on what's in the content, but if you don't get an outcome from your content, no matter how good it is, it's obviously not going to become a pillar. So I want to focus everyone's attention on the idea that You're producing content to get an outcome first, and that's what makes it a pillar. That's what makes it evergreen. That's what makes it helpful and valuable for growing a business. It's about bringing people into your world, discovering your ideas, joining your email list, and buying your products and services. So 
when I uh, first went online, uh, obviously it was very early days on the internet, 98, 99, and I, I, I feel safe saying that for the next three, four, five years, the internet, while certainly growing, was predominantly a text-based platform and was driven essentially by what we still have today, which is news content. So this hasn't changed. We still have websites that are producing lots and lots of content every day to cover what is current in the moment. It's the equivalent of the local paper, but online. Everything from your Mashables to your Huffington Post to your Business Insider to your Tech Crunch and everything in between. Now, those sites specialize in essentially producing what you would call journalist writing content, but mostly not long form. It's short form. So it's for updating of latest news, trends, what's happening right now. And as such, that content is not evergreen. It's really churn and burn content. You publish it. It's got value probably in the first hour. It's released maybe 24 hours maximum. But quickly, it, you know, very quickly, within a few days to maximum a few weeks, it's gone. It's got no relevancy. It's probably not bringing in much traffic. It might still rank well for certain search phrases, but it's dated content, so it's not going to have value anymore. And as such, it shouldn't really bring in traffic. Now, I'm going to advise you, as I have advised all my students over the years, and, and also I uh, even advised myself at one point, uh, stay away from any kind of blog business model that requires you produce news content unless that is your strategy. If you're planning on creating the next TechCrunch or Huffington Post or Mashable or Boing Boing or whatever it is you're going after, your own version of that, then be prepared for producing essentially a magazine, an online magazine or an online newspaper. And that's, I would say, impossible to do as an individual. Someone might prove me wrong who was working crazy hours to cover every piece of news. Maybe you might be going after a very small niche and there's not much news about it every day. But really, if you're producing a magazine-type blog, you're going to produce 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 new articles a day. You're going to have a team of writers producing that. you know, and, and that's not easy, and that's a different business model to what I've followed. I have had people I've worked with and graduates of my coaching programs who've use that business model. And in fact, the irony here is that those people are actually the richest of everyone I've ever helped in, in my history. Uh, that's because they get the most traffic and they've built really big publishing businesses behind their blogs. It's not just one individual expert. It's a person like Mitch Wilson who produces a lot of content with a team of writers covering all different kinds of sports. Mitch is still well and truly in the trenches producing daily videos, doing Facebook live streams, writing articles about sports as well. But it's not really just about him. It's a team of writers producing. It was crazy. I, I think the last time I spoke to him, he told me sometimes they produce up to 200 blog posts or individual pieces of content per day. Don't quote me on that. But even if we're looking at half that number or a quarter of that number, it's still a huge amount of content. And I would never expect anyone just getting started as an individual to try and attempt something like that. That's a recipe for... Uh, possibly an early grave, certainly a lot of stress, not much sleep, and a very difficult path to financial profitability too, and certainly not a laptop lifestyle. What has worked in the past, and I still think works well today with some adjustment, is the solo blogger who is aiming to really specialize and define their expertise in the market using what is called pillar content. And this is all about producing content that stands a test of time. So, what is a pillar? Just to briefly cover that. When I first came up with that phrase, I was talking about a, a, essentially a piece of content that you publish on your blog that when initially published may have an instant impact on your traffic. It, it usually does because it's shared. Uh, today it would be shared through social media. It might get a lot of uh, incoming links. It might get a lot of viral distribution on Facebook or, or another platform. It would be Twitter um, if it's more image or video based, YouTube, in, uh, Pinterest, Instagram whatever the case may be, but there is that spike and that rush. That's great, but that's not the end result. To make it a pillar, it's about long-term stable search engine traffic. That's what really makes it valuable. And usually the side effect of getting all that initial interest is a lot of incoming backlinks to that post. And that is what gives it the great search rankings. So there's obviously a synergistic process here. You're producing a piece of content that not only has immediate impact, but long-term impact because of the immediate impact it had because of the links it generated. So that's that's the strategy. Now, 
I'm not going to detail all the different types of pillars that you can produce in uh, this podcast because I've covered that in many places. There's two articles on Entrepreneur's Journey. If you type into Google pillar articles with my name, Yarrow, Y-A-R-O, you will find both those articles in the, in the first page of results. I strongly recommend you go read them when you get a chance because I break down some more of the types of pillar articles you can produce. Things like definition posts, uh, mega lists, uh, how-to posts, all the classics of effective blog content. You may know a lot of them, but you probably haven't seen all of them that I cover. A technical blueprint. There's so many um, over the years that I, I've talked about. And I, the, there's two versions of this article. The 2.0 version has more recent style uh, pillar content, things like infographics and multimedia content and so on. But what I want to talk about today is a very contentious point in terms of content, pillar articles, and etc., is this idea of marketing versus content creation. Now, you may have heard many experts on content marketing, bloggers, information marketers, go out there with the statement that today you need to focus 80% of your time and your content production on marketing and 20% on your own content. That essentially means you should be putting 20% of your time into producing a great article for your blog or a great video for your YouTube channel or your podcast. But then with 80% of your time, you got to get out there and promote like crazy. And the theory behind that is you need to put a lot of effort into marketing. Now, there's a counter argument to that in the sense that if you only put 20% of your time into content production and 80% into marketing, you're going to spend all this time marketing something that may not be that good because you only put 20% of your time into creating it. So it's a bit of a catch-22 because you essentially won't have enough time to produce something of significant value. So you're not going to get that initial a bang effect, that viral effect that you're after, that lot of sharing because people just share it through word of mouth because it's that good. If you produce a really good blog post or an amazing podcast interview or a great video, uh, it will grow and spread primarily not because you hustle to market it, that's certainly important, but primarily because other people will think it's so good that they choose to share it amongst their friends, to hit that Facebook like button or share button, even to send an email, whatever the case, whatever tool they use, they'll share it. Now, if your content's not good, that's not going to happen. So even if you put 80% of your time into pushing this content out there, you might actually be sharing something that just doesn't warrant that much exposure or that much effort to promote it because it's not going to make an impact. So the challenge today, and this is really a, a, a very important um, uh, very important strategic decision you have to make today, which is how do you divide your time into creating something that's worth sharing, that people will love, but also, especially if you're new and you don't have your own established audience, how can you get people aware of what you've done? You could create you know, the Mona Lisa blog posts, but you're brand new. You've got no existing following on social media. You've got 10 people on your email list. Your blog gets one visitor a day. doesn't matter how much uh, you know, brilliant ideas you packed into this blog post. No one's going to see it, or maybe one or two people will see it, and they'll share it with one or two people more. So it's not going to be this amazing viral effect that, you're, you know, that you would get, as opposed to, say, you know, someone who has an established audience, like uh, the, the outliers, the people who've already built an email list up, who have a large social media following, who've already built their YouTube channel, when they publish a new video, you know, it, it might not be as good as your video. It could be good, but not as good as yours. But they'll get way more exposure for it, way more distribution for it, because they have an existing audience who loves their stuff, who loves them, will share it. It'll potentially get picked up on other channels because they're already well-known. Uh, it might get picked up because they're well-known and they have well-known friends who are paying attention to their work. And when well-known friends share their work, they're reaching more people. So it's kind of like the rich get richer. The real challenge is how do you break into this upper echelon, upper echelon of people who are winning because they already have an audience. You have to build up your audience to get to that point. Now, first of all, we should assume uh, this is pretty much the case for everyone or almost everyone. No one is born with an audience. So 
all these people who are already established, they had to get there. So they have been through this part of their their journey, just as I have and just as you will go through, where they didn't have an audience, where they had to figure out how to grow that audience. Now, what's interesting is if you spend some time going through the origin stories of the sort of well-known whatevers, the YouTubers, the Instagrammers, the, the people in your industry, the people in other industries, the bloggers, the podcasters, and so on, you'll always hear a variation of the same story. There is a dedication to their craft over time. So every person who have, I've ever interviewed, and I've got some power of hindsight here because I've you know, done over 200, 250 interviews with people who've built large audiences, uh, they all have a variation of the story of spending time and really being a nobody for a period of time. It could be a year, it could be two years, it could be three, where they're putting in a lot of effort to produce good content and they're possibly putting in a lot of effort to market themselves. But usually... And this goes against that whole 80-20 skew of marketing versus content creation. Usually, they're putting in way more time into content creation. So I think it's important to take a step back and look at that advice of whether you should put 80% of your time into marketing or 20% of your time into content creation and run with that ratio. And really think of that more as advice to do more marketing than you probably already do. However, do not take it literally. Really, it probably should be flipped around. You should spend 80% of your time producing a masterpiece and then 20% of your time tapping into highly leveraged sources of traffic. Or if you're just getting started and it's not something you have access to, at the very least, spend that 20% of your time trying to open up one leveraged source of traffic, whether that, that is a certain person who will give you access to their audience, they may interview you, whether it's a certain story you could potentially get shared on uh, mainstream publicity or through any kind of you know channels of, of magazines or newspapers or radio or television or, or news type blogs. That's the one good thing about news type blogs is they're very keen for content. So if you have a good story, chances are they'll write about you. Now, those things rarely give you a one-shot wonder breakthrough. But collectively over time, when you get these door openings to new sources of traffic, there is a compound effect. And again, this is what I hear in every single story I listen to about the origins of someone who is now successful and how they got there. There'll be this slow burning process where they kind of open one door here. Maybe they get one extra well-known guest on their podcast, which leads to another, which leads to another. You know, maybe they publish this one blog post that gets uh, a few extra shares on Facebook, which then gets them in front of someone who runs a podcast and they get interviewed on that podcast, which then leads them to speaking at an event and then getting an invitation to write a book uh, and so on. You know, all these little doors open that lead to bigger doors and bigger doors. However, the entire time, that that's going on, there's always this steady, progressive production of high-quality pillar content over and over and over again. If YouTube is your focus, then, you know, every second or third day, a new video is being published on your channel. That's really good, and you keep doing that, and and not all of them are going to be great hits, but some of them will, and no matter what, you're getting this amazing back catalog, and it's all of those individual pieces of content are adding to your subscriber base. Same with blog posts. You know, you need to be publishing, I'd say minimum two times a week, but try and do high quality posts. If it's just one time a week, that's fine too, but make sure you're blowing people away with what you're producing in those blog posts. And then spend time getting that leverage. Now, let's go back to the original question. So I think we hopefully hear at least a little bit clearer on the ratio and the attitude. You cannot succeed in isolation. So you need to do marketing and probably more than you're doing right now. That's kind of like a rule for every person. Certainly everyone I've coached, uh, everyone seems to get stuck on growing their audience. And whenever I ask them, what have you done to expose new people to your work? And they'll say, well, I shared it on Facebook. But if you're sharing on a Facebook to only 100 followers, that's not going to give you a breakthrough. So yes, that's good. But you need to keep tapping into new channels. With that attitude in place, that's a starting point. But you have to have the good piece of content. So that's part Part one is the content. Part two is an attitude for marketing. But you do not go out there and market something that's not of high value. So let's move on and really dig into what is something of high value. 
Now, as I said earlier, you can read the posts I've got about pillar articles. You can go through my blog, Profits Blueprint, where I talk a lot about content production. If you're really keen, you can uh, buy one of my guides or my courses, which I cover content as well. But I want to leave you with what I think is the most important, most important, um, most important single tip I can give you about content creation. Or I'll give you more than one, but there's one main piece of advice that I think has certainly in my case been the most effective technique for content creation. It's at the heart of everything I've done in content creation since the very beginning of my blog. It's uh, very much a part of this podcast. It's uh, certainly been a part of uh, you know everything I'm doing now with content creation. I'm writing a book. And what am I talking about? What's the answer to this question? What's this one tip or technique? I believe the single most effective content formula is to do storytelling case studies whenever possible. Now, that really taps into what blogging was first about and, you know, very much still is for most blogs. And this includes video blogs, maybe not so much podcasts, but certainly blogs when they got their start. They were about an individual sharing their process, their life, their journey uh, to do something or to live something or to care about something. A lot of vloggers do the same thing today. A lot of the most successful vloggers are just sharing, you know, what, what are they buying or how are they putting on their makeup or, you know, what, what are they doing to live their life? And they're just chronicling that. It's a journey, a journal. That's very much what my blog started as too. It's uh, called Entrepreneur's Journey. And it, it, it was and it still is in many ways a place to chronicle my journey. It really was at the beginning. And then as my business grew, I kind of started to notice that not only sharing my journey works, but sharing other people's journey works really well. So in particular with, with my interview podcast, so the one you're listening to now, but when I do the interviews, they're also stories of case studies. They're people who have done something that other people would love to know how to do, and we go back in time and share that journey. It's a storytelling process that reveals a case study of a desirable outcome. So I would recommend, no matter what you're doing, try and include certainly storytelling. So you know, talk about how you lived something or did something or tried to solve a problem. And if you can, make it a case study. And by doing that, I mean simply give them a solution to a problem. So take them from the beginning and how you used to have the problem or your client used to have the problem or this person used to have the problem. Or maybe it's not a problem, it's a desire, it's an outcome, it's a change, it's something that people want, something you're interested in. Uh, maybe it's, you know, how I got onto Ellen, or maybe it's how I got 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, or maybe it's how I, you know, uh, broke my leg bungee jumping uh, 20 times in, in one week. You know, whatever the story is, uh, tell the story. So, you know, go from the beginning, work your way up, build suspense, open up some loops, make people interested in the outcome. It's a hero's journey all the classic storytelling elements, uh, and then conclude the story, you know, reach the climax, explain what happened. I really love to not just reach the climax and explain what happened. I like to then roll out some how-to steps to also teach people how to do what I just did. So that's, in, in effect, almost the answer to, to the steps for creating this kind of content it would be, you know, open up with the background, build some anticipation, open some loops, then reach the climax, deliver an outcome, and then teach people how to do it. Classic formula for producing a storytelling case study podcast, video, or written blog post. I've used that so many times in all kinds of media. I even use it on my sales pages for my products that I sell. I've used it inside the products because storytelling is a great teaching format. So if you're selling courses or membership site content or eBooks, whatever your products are, using that storytelling content case study format really works well. And what's also great about it, if you haven't lived the case study yourself, you can interview people. That's what's certainly great for podcasting, but you know, don't don't be afraid to extend that to the written word as well, to the products you create possibly, and even to do videos, you know, video interviews, uh, video stories about other people. That's what makes compelling content, storytelling, case studies. Now, obviously, that's not the only way to produce compelling content. I, I would argue that every piece of content will do better with storytelling. That is just a, a simple rule that you should all follow. 
you should follow it in particular because it's proven by science as well. Uh, if, you, if you look into some of the neurological studies that have been done uh, testing people's uh, how, how their brain fires up when they're reading content, they've actually tested something that's been more, um, I guess, pragmatic and uh, like explaining the details of something but not using a story and then something using a story so you know you can imagine if you're you're trying to describe a cube you could say well it's 10 feet tall it's got uh, one corner here another corner there it's sitting on this platform it's black that kind of content versus one day I was walking down the street and I saw this huge object crossing my path I'm not sure what it was or where it came from, but I had to find out more. And then I introduced the cube. And that that second version, the storytelling version, it fires up a part of the brain that is not triggered when you don't use the story, when you just relay the facts. And that part of the brain that fires up increases retention as well. So it not only increases engagement, people are more inclined to want to finish the story, want to hear everything you have to say, but they're also more likely to remember what you said, remember who you are. And that's important, especially as a business owner, because it means you'll be in the conversation later on when it comes to them looking potentially to buy a product or service if you are one of the people who sell a product or service on whatever it is they're trying to do. Very important point. So I could certainly dive in and and give you a list of the types of blog posts you could produce. Everything, like I said earlier, from how-to posts to definition articles to infographics and so on. But I feel that that is kind of like the easy part of producing good content. In fact, you can see examples of that all over the internet. Just go open up any successful website and look at the types of content they produce. However, I think you get a lot more if you sort of, you know, don't disregard those formats. They're very helpful starting points. That what you want to do is think first about the story. Think first about the angle you can produce that is relaying an adventure or a process that someone or something went through or at least insert some storytelling elements into it. Even if it's just a little sample of a story here, you know, maybe uh, you could be talking about anything from, you know, let's say you're talking about how to, to, to gain muscle mass and you could tell a little story about how the, the rock uh, changed his physique maybe when he was younger. If you happen to have, you know, know a story about like Dwayne Johnson or Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, I, I do this often too because I read a lot of books or I listen to a lot of audio books and the stories uh, from these people are, are locked in my memory. For example, Arnold Schwarzenegger growing up in Austria he used to do pull-ups on a tree. I remember, I think it was with his cousins and his friends, they used to hang out at this tree and he'd, he'd jump onto one of the trunks and start doing pull-ups. And that was one of the ways he started to you know, gain this interest in bodybuilding. Uh, and that's a story I could insert into one of my blog posts as a way to perhaps demonstrate the, you know, the power of uh, a, a long-term effort, for example, with you know, Arnold you know, doing something since he was a child. So that, that's another way to insert storytelling elements doesn't have to be about you doesn't even have to be about a client can be just something well known something interesting and that's what makes it powerful okay so why do we do all this why is this so important because as i said you need to produce content today that's going to have the true pillar effect which is that long-term consistent traffic Now, I can tell you from my experience, I have been literally living off the efforts of the content I've written, yes, in the last two or three years, but also in the last 10, 12, 13, 14, almost 15 years now of blogging. It's the articles that I wrote 10 years ago that bring in some email subscribers, as well as the articles that I wrote one year ago. They all bring in traffic, and it's delivering me long-term value. That traffic is turning into email subscribers, or at least some of them are, and then another small fraction are becoming customers. What's great about that, it's happening while I'm doing other things. I'm writing a book right now. I haven't written consistent blog posts in in years, really. I still publish. I still publish podcasts. But back in the early days, I was writing two, three, even five times a week. As I slowed down, I was at least writing something pretty solid once a week. And nowadays, it's it's kind of like once a month might be the you know the more more regular type of content I produce. And I'm not saying that's necessarily a good thing, but what's important is my business still runs because of the work done in the past. So I get to devote 
most of my content production time now to writing a book. Now, if you want the laptop lifestyle, if you want the potential to be doing something else, you know, maybe you want to work really hard right now and producing a ton of content. I think that's a good idea. You need to build up that initial platform, your initial profile, your initial back catalog. You know, people succeed because of what they do over time. Famous musicians have lots of albums. Famous actors have lots of movies. Famous authors have lots of books. You do build up a back catalog and you sort of jump from one success to the next, building on your efforts. And sure, you know, one movie or one book or, or one Broadway play or, or one victory in a sporting competition might be the thing that really puts you on the map. But it was all the work and all the steps you took in you know, previous competitions, previous books, previous movies or, or play productions that you've done that gave you the opportunity to have this breakthrough. So you should be looking at every day you spend producing content. It's about producing that back catalog of work, that experience, that growth that will eventually lead to that one breakthrough event or maybe it won't. Maybe you'll just have this really solid back catalog that's not bringing you millions of visitors, but it's bringing you that few thousand or a few hundred thousand you need each year in order to have a successful, profitable, full-time income from ultimately a business that could, if you do it right, run mostly without you. If you have a team and you have all this content that you created in the past that's still working for you, it's kind of like it's part of your team as well, then you've got that real laptop lifestyle uh, potential for a business. Now, what's also great about it is you don't need to worry about doing things like, you know, buying advertising. There's always that opportunity. Advertising for a lot of people is their bread and butter. It's their main growth vehicle. It's their main method of making a lot of money on the internet. But like myself, I'm traveling the world knowing that I've done the hard work to produce this content. It won't necessarily deliver the, the ongoing result forever. But, you know, it's a decade later and I'm still bringing the same income I was 10 years ago from this same business, largely based on the same content as well. So it can be fairly life changing and certainly reasonably long term. I do not expect it to last forever, but it's already delivered much more than I ever thought it would. So and I, and I really do believe when I say this to you that that opportunity to do the same is still available today because you can capture all this traffic onto an email list. And an email list is a vehicle that you always have access to for making sales of your products and services. So, you know, if you're growing a large YouTube subscriber base, but you're also growing your email list from that YouTube subscriber base, that's what matters. Same with your Instagram channel or your Pinterest profile or your blog or your Twitter, whatever it is, maybe it's all these things. If you're feeding people into an asset like an email list, you've got something that is reasonably reliable long term. Just in case Google decides to switch off all your search traffic or Twitter decides to delete your account or uh, YouTube becomes so competitive that your all your videos get 5% of the traffic they used to get. So these things can happen. I, I Like I said earlier, I don't expect my blog to do what it does or what it has done forever. In fact, my traffic does fluctuate. It's been up and it's been down over the last few years, but it's been fairly consistent in terms of delivering that business result because of that focus on long-term quality content, feeding an email list and selling products and services. Okay, so I want to end this podcast with really highlighting the most important point. Everything that I've talked about today is so important now more than ever because of the proliferation of content online. The only way that you can potentially succeed today is if you do focus on creating powerful content that really resonates with people because it's unique. To be unique, you need to put in that extra effort or ideally have a unique story. So tying this back into that main content technique of the storytelling case study, when you are sharing storytelling case studies and you're talking about maybe things that you've done that are unique or stories about your clients or your friends or you know maybe even well-known people in the world, crafting those stories make them unique. You can't really replicate them. 
And if they are compelling and they're about compelling people and they're compelling outcomes, they're going to stand the test of time. You know, people will always want to know, how did you make your first million dollars? Or how did you lose 30 pounds in the last six weeks? You know, or how, how did you get pregnant after trying for, for four years and, and not having any success? These are the sorts of things that, you know, even if you're not a superstar yourself, but you've done something that's really desirable or inspiring or compelling, or there's a story you have access to that are that is any of those things, that's how you create content that will stand out. So I encourage you to think through your own back catalog of ideas and situations you've lived through, accomplishments, experiences, your clients, your contacts, or even any people you've read about, you know, maybe read some books and you can pull some stories out from there and sort of weave things together into a narrative with a, with a story arc that also leads to a conclusion that's tailored to your audience. And that's what's important here. Storytelling with unique value to your unique audience that's what creates that powerful content that will get the distribution you need within your industry. It doesn't have to be global. It doesn't have to be industry-wide, mainstream, get on Ellen Famous. It just has to be important to the people that matter most, the people who are more likely to buy your products and services if you're running a business, of course. Okay, so I'm going to end the podcast on that point. I think it's the most important point I can give you right now on how to produce content that matters today. Really, it's not much to it. There's some simple ideas in this episode that you can walk away with and apply that I hope you really take away as more of an ethos, more of a, a big strategy, an overarching strategy for your business and, and certainly for your content. Uh, it's something I think that should be driving what you do, but obviously on a micro level, you're going to have to go out there and you know put in the work to find those unique stories, to produce that unique content, but it's well worth it because over time, you'll get those leveraged pieces of content that deliver the traffic long-term, and that's what you want. The more of that you, pr you can produce, the quicker and the bigger you'll grow and the more likely you'll get to that outcome you're really, really looking for. Okay, uh, as I said, I'm going to put the links to those two blog posts about pillar content uh, that I talked about earlier, or you can just go to Google and, and type in uh, pillar articles or pillar content, and you'll find the Entrepreneur's Journey posts about that that I've written over the years. And uh, I hope you got something out of this. Most importantly, I hope you're, you're thinking primarily about the value of the content you produce, because that's how you can stand out and, and win in your industry. Don't neglect marketing. I don't want you to suddenly think that you don't have to market, especially if you're new, because if nobody knows your name, you're going to have to get out there and shout your name for people to discover you. But if you're shouting your name backed by a powerful story, people are more likely to listen. So get the storytelling, the case study, the value up front right first, and then start looking at the marketing. And I would suggest if you're listening to me right now and you're thinking, you know, I'm, I'm working really hard, but nothing's getting traction. I go back and look at your content and really ask yourself, are you producing something that's unique, that's special to your audience? Because chances are you're producing something that's essentially a derivative of someone else's work. It might be good, but it's not as good as someone else doing something better in your industry or someone else who just happens to be more well-known in your industry. And because they have the lion's share of attention, even if their article is slightly worse than yours, they're going to do way better than you because they already have the attention. So you need to do much more. You need to get. You basically need to produce something that will get someone already well known in your industry go, to go, "Wow, who is this new person? This is amazing." And in fact, you know, you might need to go create a story for this to actually happen. If you haven't lived yet, or you haven't found, uh, you know, people to work with who are doing some amazing things you might have trouble coming up with value because you haven't got the stories to share yet. So if that's the problem you face, you might need to read some books. You might need to go out and get out there and live a little. You might need to build a business or you know, lose some weight or overcome a big problem, really get a result that people care about, uh, whatever it is you're you know, trying to do or trying to help people with, and then build your, your content around those new stories that you're starting to live. Okay, that's it. Uh, I'm going to call it the end of this uh, special podcast on content for the current crowded internet marketing landscape that we all face today. Uh, my name is Yarrow. If you want to get the show notes and the links I talked about to go along with this EJ podcast, just go to ejpodcast.com forward slash the number six. This is the sixth 
solo episode of the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. However, there are hundreds of interviews I've done with other online entrepreneurs, in particular bloggers and podcasters and, and video bloggers, content creators who use content to build their platform, grow their audience, and essentially build laptop lifestyle business that they can run while traveling the world and making sales of their own digital products and services. And all of them, every person I've interviewed who's ever succeeded with content has done it off the back of amazing, amazing storytelling or and or fantastic teaching. It's this, it's usually the same thing, teaching through storytelling, lots of practical stuff with the how-to steps, but lots of storytelling to grab the attention and the engagement. Okay, that's ejpodcast.com forward slash the number six for the show notes. My name is Yarrow, and I'll talk to you on the very next Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that episode of the EJ podcast. If you're interested in following in the footsteps of myself and many other successful people who use blogs to grow a business, then I invite you to download a free copy of my Blog Profits Blueprint Report, which has been downloaded over 150,000 times and is the starting point for many very successful bloggers today. It's an A to Z guide on how to choose a topic market your blog, set all the technology up, and of course, make money from blogging as well. 100% free in audio and written text. You can get it from blogprofitsblueprint.com. Just enter your email address there and I'll send you a free download for the Blog Profits Blueprint. Thanks again for listening.